Let us pray together. Loving and gracious God, on this day, on this Advent Sunday, be near to us once more as word and as song, as light and as spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be truly acceptable in your sight, O covenant God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we've heard hymns and we've heard the first reading from Luke, which was Mary's song of exaltation, as well as prophetic um, forecasting of what was to come in God's realm. In a similar way, we're going to hear now a passage from the book of Hebrews. Now, Hebrews is a fascinating book in the New Testament. It has some of the most citations of the Old Testament in any one book of the New Testament. And in fact, the first chapter has seven different quotes from the Old Testament scriptures. And the passage I'm going to read from Hebrews 8 is the longest continuous quoting of Old Testament scripture in the New Testament material. So the Hebrews title is appropriate. It's pulling the story of the prior word and the Old Testament into the language of faith of the new church. So the words are actually Jeremiah's words, but they're recorded for us in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 8 to 12. So listen to God's word. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I had no concern for them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after these days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall not teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. And I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, the pivotal word in the passage I just read is the word covenant, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but first we need to deal with the two little words that were used to modify covenant, the words old and new, as in the old covenant I made with your ancestors and the new covenant I will now establish. If all the marketing in the Christmas season has taught us well, then we know quite clearly that, well, old is bad and new is good. I was reminded of this when I recently had an issue with my iPhone. I had to make one of those perilous appointments at the so-called Genius Bar at the Apple Store. If ever there is a place I have felt less like a genius, it is there. I glanced around the store while I was waiting for someone to help me, and when someone finally came forward, I said, by the way, what is the latest type of Apple Watch that you sell? To which came the exuberant reply, oh, the Apple Watch 7, which caused me to cover up my sturdy Apple Watch 3. I didn't mention while well, I was having trouble with my iPhone, and they were quick to remind me that they have a special on the new iPhone 13, but I shook my head as I handed her my trusty iPhone 6. <laughs> and you should know that I wrote this entire sermon on my faithful Dell computer that I bought in 2010. <laughs> now that I've horrified everyone under 30, <laughs> and Ed, <laughs> the old versus the new. We clearly have a bias against the one and a preference for the other. And ultimately, that's not a big deal if we're talking about cars or cell phones, but it becomes problematic if we push this distinction about old and new into the realm of our faith. We might be tempted to believe that God's Old Testament, Old Covenant, with the people of Israel is no longer any good. 
and that all that matters is the New Testament, the new covenant revealed in Jesus. But that type of thinking can lead down a slippery slope of religious prejudice. In the Old Testament, we read about God's covenant with the people of Israel, a covenant made known in God's promises to Abraham and Sarah, or to Moses on Mount Sinai, or to David on the throne in Jerusalem. If God's promises to all those people is suddenly no longer valid, then God is no longer trustworthy. And that line of thought can lead to anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish biases, and that is a stain on the faith we profess. Given the whole history of God's involvement with humanity, it's actually better to think of a historic and old covenant that in Christ Jesus has been renewed, expanded, written clearly now on our hearts and our minds. And within this new covenant, what we're called to do is honor the past, even as we walk by faith into the future. So now let's look at the other word, covenant. A covenant is not a contract. Contracts are legally binding documents that force behavior from two people. The power comes from the letter of the law. Where a covenant, a covenant is an agreement that's mutually entered into by two or more parties to basically look out for the best interests of one another. Now, sometimes one party may do more than the other, but frankly, no one keeps score. A covenant's power comes from honoring the spirit of the law. So to help explain this concept of covenant, there are three words that I want you all to repeat after me. That's also a way to make sure no one's dozed off. So here are the three words. The words are with for and unto. God's commandments, and particularly God's covenant, is first a commitment to be with us and vice versa. This is basically a covenant of presence. God revealed this covenant through the Torah, through the law given on Mount Sinai, but also through the words and wisdom of the prophets down through the ages. And then that same covenant with us was renewed and expanded through God's presence made known in Christ, through this incarnation, God with us, the birth in Bethlehem, through the wisdom of Jesus' parables and miracles that are still with us through Scripture, and through the ongoing connection we have with Christ, the risen Lord of Easter. So in addition to that, secondly, a covenant is not just something with us, it is something for us. As a species and as individuals, we don't have the best track record when it comes to honoring agreements and keeping all of our promises. The very thing which we ought not to do, we often do. And the very thing we ought to do, we don't do. Now, I'm not going to list off examples. You all know yourselves the ways we've faltered in this area. So the preacher and professor Tom Long described covenants in this way. He said a covenant is a two-way arrangement in which people are to hold on firmly to their end of the rope while God has promised to hold on firmly to God's end and to pull us to a place of safety and healing and life. But we, we grow weary, and we let go of our end. But God does not. God keeps covenant. God keeps faith. God holds on to that rope, even when we don't. God acts in covenant for us. And why does God do this? Because every covenant has a purpose. It is directed unto some goal. Now, these goals are bigger than any one of us, any one of our lifespans or experiences. It stretches far beyond today and our boundaries in this community to the horizons of the world. It involves a hope that carries us even in the valley of the shadow of death. It involves a peace that passes understanding. It involves a joy that is deeper than momentary happiness. And it involves love 
that is healing, that is energizing, that restores us in our relationships. Remember the four Advent candles of hope, peace, joy, and love. And that's why Advent is the perfect season to talk about covenants. A covenant renewed in Christ because it's a covenant that is made with us, for us, and directed unto God's goal of healing the nations. All right, now I'm going to shift to a new topic. Back in the 1970s, Bruce Alexander was a psychologist who was studying all the research related to drug addiction. Now in the 70s, several of the studies had done an experiment with what were called Skinner boxes. They would put a rat in a small cage, isolated and alone from other rats, and in that cage, if the rat depressed a lever, it could have access to a small liquid dose of an addictive drug, heroin, morphine, cocaine. Now, in that setting, typically the rats hit the lever, the lever a lot, and they would consume large doses of the drugs and become thoroughly addicted. And so this led all of the community to focus on the addictive quality of drugs. And therefore, the drug prevention programs of 50 years ago all focused on stopping people from ever trying drugs at all. The campaigns just say no, or this is your brain on drugs. But unfortunately, this approach put all the blame on the drug user, who many then felt, well, they just simply lacked the self-control and the moral strength to say no. But Bruce Alexander took a different approach. He knew that rats are by nature social creatures. And so instead of isolating them in these tiny Skinner cages, he literally built a rat park, complete with toys for them to play with, plenty of food and plenty of water, and 16 to 20 rats of both genders who they could all mingle with. In this case, all the rats could drink from a dispenser with plain water or a dispenser that had drugged water with morphine or heroin. They found that the rats in the rat park consistently refused the drugged water. None of the addictive behavior from the earlier studies could be replicated when it was done in this healthier setting. And even the rats who had spent months in cages living almost entirely on morphine water chose normal water when they were moved to the rat park and voluntarily themselves went through the drug withdrawal symptoms. Now to me what this does is it illustrates our human tendency to think in terms of individual contracts and to forget communal covenants to blame others, and to let go of our side of the rope that connects us not only to God, but to one another. It's true, drugs are addictive, but given the fact that we are living through the largest drug epidemic and drug-related deaths in our country's history, it's important to remember that blaming the user resolves nothing, and it's actually morally defective. We exist in covenants with each other, which means that we're called to speak up if people are isolated in cages or solitary confinement, or speak up when people are pushed to the gutters with no resources when times are hard, or when they're told that they're to blame when they self-medicate and that they should just figure something out when things get rough. Honoring covenants with and for one another should be something that's, that's different, that's literally written on our minds and our hearts, something that we know to be true deep down, no matter what we see modeled around us. It can't just be head knowledge, because you can be absolutely clear about something in your head and still be totally wrong. You can believe, yes, it's okay for the American nation to not consistently offer paid family leave or universal child care. 
You can believe that it's appropriate for misguided rioters to storm the Capitol and to throw concrete blocks and fire extinguishers at police people. You can know that in your head and still be wrong. God wants us to be motivated instead from our hearts and to motivate our wills for us never to forget that we are connected to one another. We are all holding the end of the rope that extends into God's hand, and we will only be pulled together to a place of safety and peace and love. Now, as a guide for this, I appreciate something that George Orwell once wrote. George Orwell is best known for his books, Animal Farm and 1984. He was a passionate person dedicated to trying to improve the human condition. And so at one point he said, fighting for bread for all is important, but it alone isn't enough. He said, I believe people also have a right to roses, to a life in which there's beauty and creativity and a rich interior life. Bread and roses, head and heart. Covenant thinking that is known so well, known so deeply that you don't have to teach one another about it. It is self-evident and it is present in our midst by God's grace and God's power. And you know that it's true. Now the sermon's at its end and I really haven't said hardly anything about the word love, even though that's the theme for this fourth Sunday in Advent. The word love, frankly, is overused. At times it can feel like grape Kool-Aid, like eating an entire box of Krispy Kreme donuts or like a marathon of Hallmark Christmas movies. But Advent love is different and it's deeper than that. Advent love is the promise that God has made never to let go of the rope. A promise to be with us always. When God promised to take flesh on Christmas and then allow that flesh to be wounded and nailed to a cross. And that broke forth with the light of new life and the light of love that even now 2,000 years later still shines upon us. Advent love talks of life in the first person plural. We are in this together. And it talks of music and laughter, of bread and roses. Advent love keeps looking at what is to come, and it finds strength for today in the promises and the hope that we have for tomorrow. And that Advent love, it's old. It's older than my computer. It's older than the scriptures. But in Christ, it's been renewed, and it's what we know to be true. So for that Advent blessing, thanks be to God. Amen.